Good evening, and welcome to another forum here at the John F. Kennedy School and in the John F. Kennedy Forum. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Institute of Politics, uh, which has, as you know, for so many years, uh, been the sponsor of this forum uh, and is now run by Bill Purcell, wonderfully well, who's here on the, uh, on the front row. Uh, and we're happy at the Center for Public Leadership uh, to join as co-sponsors in the uh, visit of our speaker uh, tonight. Uh, and I'm David Gergen. I'm here on the faculty and the director of the center. Some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was conventional wisdom in this country uh, that children from poor backgrounds probably could not be educated until one fixed poverty, mended families, and created a much better conditions or environment in which those children were to grow up. And that argument, of course, meant that for year after year, we postponed taking serious ac action and testing that proposition because we weren't able to eradicate poverty, we weren't able to mend families, and millions upon millions of children were neglected and left behind. And society thought that's just inevitable. Well, there were a few hardy souls who did not accept that convention of wisdom and one of them is our speaker tonight. While she was a senior at Princeton at the Woodrow Wilson School, and we give due credit from the Kennedy School to the Woodrow Wilson School, a tip of the hat uh, to that worthy institution. While she was a senior there, she wrote a thesis uh, proposing a, an organization that might try to close the equity gap to bring social justice uh, to this country. Uh, and if you've read her book, you know that she wasn't quite sure what she was going to do with herself after she left Princeton, but it, the thought struck that maybe she ought to start that organization. And she started with nothing. Nothing. She's living proof that someone at a young age, in college or in graduate school, can begin a life of service and leadership at a very young age. Because within a year, she had her first core members, uh, in training, and then they went into the toughest schools in America. Uh, and the rest is history. It's been a remarkable organization. Teach for America today, they've just announced a lot this week uh, that two years ago, I think the number of applications uh, for, for, from college seniors was around 25,000 or so. Last year, it was around 35,000. This year, over 46,000 college seniors have applied to a Teach for America for just, for, for just over 4,000 spots. It's very hard to get in this organization these days. It's very hard indeed. And I want to tell you some of the other numbers. There are now 7,300 core members all together, and they have an impact on 4, 450,000 children uh, in this country. An impact on 450,000 children. This is from one individual who started with nothing other than an idea to build that. <clears throat> the organization is growing. There are now 17,000 alumni, uh, and they have become a force uh, for public good. Let me say a little bit more about the applicants and then also a little bit more about the alumni. Among the applicants, 12% of Ivy League seniors this year have applied to Teach for America. At Harvard, the highest in the Ivy League, 18% of the seniors in this, in this, over here in the college have applied to spend two years in these tough urban schools and tough rural schools. 40% of the African Americans in the graduating class have applied to Teach for America. Many of the applications in many of the schools come from disadvantaged backgrounds. They know the face of poverty and of hardship. At Yale, I think the number is some 60, 70 to 80 percent of the Pell Grant recipients, Pell Grant recipients which typically go to lower income families uh, to allow someone to go to college. So 70 to 80 percent of them have applied to Teach for America. They understand what the challenge is. Of the alumni, over 60 percent remain engaged in education in one way or another full time. Over 60 percent. They don't just stamp their tickets. Uh, they don't simply uh, go on, you know, get a couple of years and sort of gild their resume so they can go to law school or business school. They remain forces for public school 
uh, reform and for closing the equity gap. The KIPP schools would not exist today were it not for Teach for America. Michelle Rhee wouldn't be trying to, to reform the most difficult, hardest school system in the country. Joel Klein wouldn't be reaching out and getting over a thousand core members. The charter school movement wouldn't have taken off in the way it has. You wouldn't be hearing the stories about, if you want to see what's working in education, come to Harlem and look at the charter schools. That's all because of the success of people coming in to Teach for America, teaching for a couple of years, becoming then really passionate. And one more thing, which is the most important thing of all, they are proving day by day by day that all children can learn, that you don't have to wait to end poverty. You don't have to wait to mend broken families. It can be done. The failures in our public schools are not the failures of the kids. The failures are the failures of adults who are not providing the kind of educational opportunities that these kids deserve. And there is one person who has proved that, that proposition more than anybody else in America today, and that's our speaker tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Wendy Cobb. There's nothing better than being introduced by David Gergen. That was such a beautiful introduction. Um, and, you know, we're kind of honored and, and uh, just very lucky to have, have um, him on our board of directors at Teach for America, providing incredible guidance and um, help as we navigate all the various challenges of building the public sector support necessary to grow our impact over time. Um, I'm excited to, to be here um, tonight to um, just share a few thoughts about really what motivates me and my colleagues, and I see some of you um, who are part of the Teach for America community um, to just stay at this work um, and to feel, I don't know, just greater urgency and greater optimism than ever about um, about the possibilities in, in this broader effort to ensure that all kids do have an opportunity to attain an excellent education, um, and then to, to really just engage in a discussion with you all. Um, as, you know, maybe some of you know, I, I came to this initially um, because I guess this idea just emerged from a couple of things coming together. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, my own kind of funk as a member of the quote me generation. Supposedly all we wanted to do was go out and work on Wall Street and that label just struck me as so kind of false. Um, I felt like I was one of, you know, thousands of talented driven graduating seniors who were just searching for something they weren't finding in terms of a way to make a real difference in the world. And I'd been really focused on this issue of educational inequity, just the fact that we're you're born in our country does do so much to determine your educational outcomes and in turn life outcomes and had, you know, organized a conference on it and done other things that concerned college students do, took courses on it and such. Um, and one day, you know, this idea just struck me. I think everything came together and I just thought, you know what, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to teach in our country's lowest income communities as we were being recruited at the time to work on Wall Street? And it was one of those, you know, when I thought of that idea, I became so kind of, you know, obsessed by it because I thought it would have such a power in the short run and in the long run. In the short run, um, because we'd be channeling all this incredible energy um, and talent into classrooms in our most disadvantaged communities, and I thought that would make a huge impact for kids growing up today. And at the same time, I thought it would just be so powerful to take you know, our future leaders and have their first kind of influential experience right out of college be, you know, teaching in high poverty communities instead of working on Wall Street. And I just thought that would influence the consciousness of our country and, and our priorities as a country. So what got me into this was, I guess, a big idea and, and idealism and such. Um, but what kept me in it is is really what I've learned along the way about both how massive this problem is and, and how um, devastating it is for kids and families um, who are 
kind of stuck in today's public education system um, in, in our most economically disadvantaged communities, but also seen kind of juxtaposed against the problem such incredible evidence about the possibility of actually solving it. And I think it's, um, it's really seeing those two things together at, at every level in classrooms and, and schools and, and in the system at large that, um, that has, has led me to feel just greater and greater responsibility every year to say we have to you know, turn this into a truly unstoppable movement to ultimately really move the needle against the problem. Um, you all, uh, no doubt, from different angles have some sense of, of the dimensions of, of the issue. Um, it is still shocking to me to realize that in our country, you know, which aspires so admirably to be a land of equal opportunity, um, you know, we have 13 million kids who live below the poverty line. Half of them won't graduate from high school. The half who do graduate will have an eighth grade skill level compared to kids you know, in, in high-income communities. Um, and, and one in 10 of our kids in low-income communities will actually graduate from college. Um, so this is just a problem of kind of vast proportions. And when you see that play it, itself out in the lives of real kids, it's just, it's truly, like we're literally in many of our urban and rural areas, we're just cutting kids' futures off. Um, and yet, what I've seen over the last 20 years is just so much evidence of how possible it is to actually eliminate that problem. Um, I think back to you know 20 years ago when I was a senior in college, there was a hit movie um, called Stand and Deliver, uh, which you know took a teacher in South Central Los Angeles who had coached a class of kids to pass the AP Calculus uh, exam, and it made a national hero out of this teacher. And you know it's interesting to think about that because what created the drama in the movie was that ETS questioned the test results and you know Hollywood thought this was going to be a big hit because it seemed so stunning and I had to catch myself a few years ago when I thought back to my reaction to that movie personally um, because I remember what I thought was that this guy was just a superhero um, whose success couldn't be replicated. And the reason I caught myself a few years ago was that I was just thinking, huh, it's interesting. Because I felt like I knew, you know, not thousands, but certainly dozens of even teachers in their first and second years who were having that kind of truly just transformational impact um, on their kids' futures. And, you know, I thought about that as just, you know, how much progress we've made at some level, you know, where you could take a a teacher whose success seemed so stunning that we would, you know, make a national hero out of him and, and then just reflect on how many more visible examples we have in so many communities across the country of that kind of success at the classroom level. Um, but even more striking, I think, is just to, to realize that, you know, 15 years ago, arguably, we had two or three schools in low-income communities that were taking whole buildings full of kids and putting them on track to graduating from college at the same pace as, as schools in, in high-income communities. And the thought was that those couple of schools were the product of charismatic leadership, that when those leaders left, the results would, would plummet. There wasn't a thought that we knew how to build schools like that and we could replicate them. And I just think, wow, you know, in a mere 15 years, how far we've come, um, where today we have, you know, dozens of communities that have at least one school and, and probably dozens at this point that have, you know, growing numbers of schools that are doing that. And where the assumption and the reality is that we do know how to create schools that work for kids who face all the challenges of poverty and are truly attaining in an absolute sense just incredible success and where the leaders can leave and we can replace those leaders i mean the leaders are critical to these schools but we know we know how to do this um, i think about uh you know just reflecting on how dramatically fast at some level the change is i was saying earlier to um someone at harvard who was just accepted into Teach for America and assigned to Philadelphia, I was saying, you know, it's interesting because I remember Teach for America developing our first Philadelphia site seven years ago. And um, the Philadelphia public school system, um, you know, is, is certainly one of our 
countries most challenging. And our team there was struggling to build a culture of excellence among our core members because, you know, they had started teaching in schools that, that were certainly not doing right by their kids. And it's, it's hard in a first year site with a few core members in some pretty dysfunctional schools, it's possible to get really sucked into that culture instead of, you know, the Teach for America culture, and we were trying to figure out how do we pull people back from a culture of survival and really ensure that people are striving to excel with their kids and not just survive with their kids. And so a number of our senior team went to Philadelphia, and I went to Philadelphia, and we were walking around schools, and um, I just remember having a conversation with our team there and saying, you know what, we need to find the examples of success in Philadelphia. Let's, there's got to be, you know, classrooms that we can find, is there a whole school where we can, you know, let's get professional development days for our teachers and get them to go see what is possible for the same kids. Um, and our team's solution was to give our core members train tickets. That was seven years ago. Today there's no need for train tickets. We were literally putting them on trains and having them go to New York to see that it was possible to build a completely, to put kids in very similar conditions in New York City on a path to a completely different educational outcomes than um, the kids in our core members class in Philadelphia were, were on track to. Um, and, you know, I just think about, I mean, today there's definitely no need for train tickets. There are at least 10 whole schools and, and all sorts of other classrooms where you can see real evidence of what's possible for kids right there in Philadelphia. And that kind of progress, I mean, we could talk about many, many different communities. So, you know, to, to David's point, the, the conversation has has really changed in the last 20 years. And um, I think it would be fair to say that the prevailing ideology 20 years ago, influenced hugely by the Coleman Report, which showed that, in fact, socioeconomic background determined educational outcomes. You know, I think there was a mindset, even in the most elite of policy circles and the most elite of kind of journalistic circles, that your socioeconomic background determined your educational outcomes. And today, you know, in the most elite of policy circles and the most elite of journalistic circles, um, people know that it is possible to do this. We're surrounded by so much evidence um, that it is possible. And now the question is, can we do this at the system level? You know, can we create whole systems of schools that serve kids well? And even to that question, it's just, I think it's stunning to see what has happened in the last eight years. Now, all qualified by the, the reality that we have not moved the needle against the aggregate problem. The statistics I laid out earlier, we still have the same situation that we had, you know, in aggregate, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, but there are, there are systems that are, in fact, moving the needle against the problem at a whole system level. And I, I, think, um, I think about, you know, I actually remember really clearly eight years ago Mayor Bloomberg's speech in New York where he said that he was going to take over the, the school system and bring principles of management and accountability inside the school system. Um, it was such a striking speech because it was so different uh, than, than anything that had gone on before, certainly in New York City and really anywhere. Um, and just to see the progress, and you know, there's lots of controversy in New York City about you know, what's working and what's not. But the fact is, we are, I just heard last week that the percentage of African-American boys graduating from high school in New York has doubled in the last eight years. And it's still dismally low, but 24% of our African-American boys were graduating from high school in New York City eight years ago. And I believe I'm right that 48% are today. And you know, we have a long way to go, but that's moving the needle. And, and there's all sorts of other evidence there of serious system level progress. Um, if people had asked any group of reformers and philanthropists and policymakers five years ago to list the most dysfunctional school systems in America, there's really little doubt in my mind that people would have listed New Orleans and Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland, uh, um, certainly among the top five. And to see what's happening in those three places today, you know, um, still certainly the verdict is out. You know, will we truly, you know, will we get as far as we need to get for kids? But 
there is such dramatic progress happening in, in, in those communities, just compl things that people never would have predicted would be possible a mere four or five years ago. Um, so I take just incredible hope from that. And, and what really fuels my optimism is realizing at every level of this, whether we're looking at you know the classroom level or the school level or, or the system level, there is no magic to this. I mean, that's what's really encouraging. There's nothing elusive. It's not something that we have to go out and try to figure out how in the world do we do this. It's about basic things, things that account for success anywhere. It's about talent and leadership and building strong cultures and having clear um, goals and continuously improving. It's about all the basics. There's something very discouraging in that too because for all of all of the policy folks and everyone else out there who wants to make this easy, there's no way. There's no way to make this easy. It's going to take a lot of hard work, but the good news is that you know we know how to do it. It's, it's about literally, will we channel enough, you know, truly of our talent and, and resources and energy against this, this goal? Um, and I, I can't imagine a better investment as a country Clearly, um, you know, if we can, we could truly live up to our, our true potential and, and promise as a country. That's what I feel like I've learned over the last, you know, 20 years in this. And it's just a question of, of whether we will. And I think it's a question really simply of whether enough of our country's most talented, determined future leaders will, will channel their energy in, in this direction. Um, and, and that gives me optimism as well, because, you know, to, to the the to what David said earlier, you know, who would have thought that that, you know, for 18 years in Teach for America's history, there was one constraint on our growth and it was recruits. And we viewed our whole daily existence at Teach for America as being a war for talent. You know, can we truly get more of the most sought after folks in our country to channel their energy against the problem we think is our most fundamental problem? And the fact that, I mean, I wish we weren't turning away people who we think have what it takes to do this well, but the fact that we're at this point where we, we can't even accommodate all, all of the interest is, it, it, it's certainly reason for, for optimism that we've arrived at a, in a new place and, and truly have the potential um, to gain serious traction. We'll bring more people in to Teach for America alone this year um, than we did in our whole first decade. And you know the folks we brought in in the first decade are at the center of the reform effort today. So that's that's what gives me optimism. I just know in, in five or ten years we're gonna we're gonna see the needle start moving. Not only because of Teach for America, but you know we're we're part of a much larger effort and working alongside many others. But um, so many reasons for for optimism. So that's that's my message to start us off. Thank you, Wendy, and <clears throat> thank you for joining us again and for this audience and for the audience this is uh, being broadcast to in various uh, uh, forms over the internet. So uh, I, let, let me come back to, we're going to have a, a, a conversation here for a few moments and then open this up to your, your questions with our microphones around. Uh, but I want to come back to uh, what the secrets are to this. What's the secret first? Let's start in the classroom. What's the secret to turning around? a class. What do you tell a Teach for America core member when you walk in there? Because I keep hearing these tales. It's really hard for some of these folks when they first walk in the door. It's a tough challenge. It's so hard. And I have a feeling that there are Teach for America alumni in the audience who um, you know, could keep this very real and probably answer your question more effectively than I could. Um, you know, I do, there's nothing, there's no way to make this easy. Um, the encouraging thing again though is, you know, here's what happened to, to me is that I actually, I started meeting, you know, people among our, our core members who were having what I would say are truly just life changing impacts on their kids. A tiny fraction of them, right? Like I, I would find myself in classrooms in, you know, year 10 of Teach for America and not be able to leave and just think literally the kids in this room are going to have different life paths because of what this particular teacher is doing. And 
I started spending, and ultimately our organization started spending time with the tiny, tiny fraction of folks to try to understand, you know, what were they doing differently? To have not just an incrementally positive, of course, important impact for their kids, but just a transformational impact on their kids. Um, and we came to believe that, you know what, it's, they're doing what the most effective leaders would do anywhere, you know, so they'll, um, you know, walk into the, the uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a perfect example. Actually, last week, I was in the classroom of a second year Teach for America core member named Jennifer Lopez, um, very memorable, um, and uh, in, in Los Angeles. And um, she had taken a class of 10th graders, geometry uh, kids who, you know, I think the, typically about 30% of the 10th graders in Los Angeles um, are proficient according to the state, you know, standards and the state tests. And, you know, in her first year, she said, you know what, the big goal here is 100%. We are going to prove we're going to be the highest performing geometry students in, in the class or in the, in, the, in the district. And she got her kids just on a mission. Like, that's what a great leader does, right? Says, here's the vision. It sounds crazy. Any mere mortal would say that's crazy. You, you can't take kids who don't even have the basic math skills and you know have all of them, you know, getting you know proficient and advanced proficient on, on these tests on the test at the end of the year. She said that's where we're going to go, and she got the kids to own that. I mean, literally, her kids are owning that. Like that's the goal. She gets her kids on an absolute mission. They're working harder than they've ever worked before to catch up in their basic skills and and move ahead and she realizes you know I mean actually in the second year core members classroom I was marveling at what she was doing to maximize her time with her kids and engage them not just in like drill and kill not even remotely the things she was doing that were getting her kids thinking on such a deep level about math it was truly inspiring I was dying I was wanting my own kids to have a teacher who taught at this level of, of critical thinking. Um, but she also realized I can't possibly pull this off in the time that I have. You know, so again, like a great leader, you keep your eye on the goal, and whatever the obstacles are that come at you, you figure out, what am I going to do? She, she started just getting her kids to come every single Saturday, now Sundays, because she says, I got Teach for America activities on Saturday, so now every Sunday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., she's got her kids coming to school. Um, and you know, in her first year, all but one of her kids, you know, was proficient or advanced on, on this on this on this test. I mean, it's it's truly incredible by any standard result. So, but but ultimately, it, it is about it is about leadership. You know, and how I know you put a lot of emphasis upon teaching leadership. You've got this new book out, the manual that's out now on this. How do you teach it to your? So you take one person who's really gifted, mm -hmm. like Jennifer Lopez, and has that kind of magic. How do you, uh, how do you uh, uh, implant that in others? Well, that is, that, is, that is the pursuit that Teach for America is on. You know, how do we, how do we become great trainers and, and great developers? Um, I actually don't think it is magic, you know? I mean, it is true that a few of our people found their own paths to that kind of transformational success. Um, but ultimately, you know, it takes a lot to teach that way. And, you know, we, we work with our core members to try to help them understand how do we set, like, the big compelling visions and get our kids deeply invested in that um, and teach really in, in a very goal-oriented way. And, you know, how do we instill the mindsets that would lead someone to retain, you know, sort of full locus of control over, over the outcome. So I don't know, it's a matter of skills and knowledge and mindsets like, like anything else. I mean, we're not where we need to be, but we're getting better and better. I mean, more and more of our teachers are teaching at that kind of level. Uh, this is a delicate question, but one that uh, I think a lot of people talk around, around at, at privately at, at night. Uh, it, it's well understood the American school system. We had one of the we had one of the best school systems in the world for much of the 20th century, and then uh, because we had such talented people teaching in part, and when we had the highest high school graduation rates, we had the highest college graduation rates in the world, uh, and it, and you know the, there are two economists over here in the yard, uh, Larry Katz and Olivia Golden, who published a book saying that was the reason for America's great prosperity and success as a nation. Uh, that was the core reason. Uh, and then they came along with time, there were so many people who were then, there were a lot of women teaching because they had no other opportunities. 
And it was really important breakthrough for us as a society to open the doors up and provide other opportunities for women. But a lot of the talented people then went as they should and appropriately went and you know climbed other mountains and now they're university presidents and they're you know they're running their secretary of state and they're doing many other things. Uh, but what we found was that what the we with the, the talent pool that was going into public school teaching declined. And now with Teach for America, you're attracting some really talented people back in. Can you address that question? Because it does seem to me to have at least part of the difference in, a, say, a math class is going to be the quality of someone who's teaching. And it's fascinating. I think beyond Teach for America, you know, what's, what's interesting is 10 years ago, our school districts were not recruiting. And, and literally, I remember speaking at a conference, and I, we had realized school districts don't think they need to recruit. Um, because we were working with all the human resource departments. Maybe this doesn't seem plausible, but the idea was that it's not their job. Schools of education produce the teachers, the districts hire them, and that's just how it should work. So these districts would just start the year with vacancies. And not only that, they would just take whoever came. And I'm really not exaggerating. As much recruitment as would get done would be in New York City, there, and I still remember the subway ads there were subway ads with 10 point font. I'm not kidding. Does anyone remember these? Listing all the vacant teaching positions. Listing all the, well, listen, listing all the vacancies in schools? Yeah, like listing well, I don't, the schools. Yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable. There was no recruitment. And I remember speaking at a conference and suggesting that school districts should simply do what any successful organization does and what Teach for America does, which is go out and recruit people aggressively. Recruit at schools of education, where 40% of our graduates don't end up going into teaching, no doubt. Many among them, the people who are the most sought after by other sectors, um, you know, they should recruit as far beyond that as they need to in order to find enough people who have the personal characteristics necessary to succeed, and then they select them according to high standards and invest in their training and development. And I remember a very prominent person in the education reform community was so frustrated to hear this and raised his hand and said, why should we have to recruit? And it wasn't like he's a perfectly well-intentioned person, but it just seemed like, it didn't seem, it seemed like that was a statement that it didn't matter or something, that teaching didn't matter, like people should, like it shouldn't have to be that way. That's how foreign that idea was. So you fast forward to today and there are things working in a different direction, I mean, as you say, People have many more opportunities, women, et cetera. Um, but the fact is today, our districts have actually figured out they should recruit. Um, and you know, it's a, different, it's a different world. I mean, in the last, um, I just read, there was a study out recently that showed that New York City in the last five years has completely closed the qualification gap between teachers in the low income schools and, and the higher income schools um, through aggressive recruitment um, of very talented people. Um, not only bringing in Teach for America folks, but recruiting from other young professionals, mid-career professionals, et cetera, in New York. And, you know, they have 20,000 applications for, um, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 spots. And, and we're seeing that in districts across the country. So I think there's just a lot we can do to solve. So, so how much of a difference does it make to have a, a more talented person? How much of a difference does it make if on, if on average uh, one school has uh, teachers with combined SAT scores uh, on a 1600 basis of a thousand and another school school has teachers at 1250. How much of a difference does that make in the performance of the, of the kids, the results? You know, I mean, we're all trying to figure out what the personal characteristics are that differentiate yeah. the most successful teachers. Um, we actually, we, we've done a lot around that and have, you know, there are clear differentiators. I mean, first of all, to your larger point, you know, having a really effective teacher I, I'm, I'm actually losing the statistics right now, but if you have a top quartile teacher three years in a row, it makes a completely dramatic impact on your academic levels. I mean, completely yeah, the dramatic. Yeah, if, so if you're you, a kid. When you say top quartile of what? Of, top of, quartile of teachers. If you have a top quartile teacher three years in a row, someone out here probably knows the statistics, you literally basically you know, put kids in the top quartile. Um, yeah. So it makes a huge difference, but the question of what is it that makes a difference? You know, what is the what is it about the teacher that makes the difference? We would actually say it's 
it's a set of personal characteristics. And you know, you, you actually, it's not about necessarily academic levels as much as it is about, in, in our context at least, um, certainly past demonstrated achievement as an indication of, of future success. But the personal characteristics that we've found to really differentiate people are perseverance in the face of challenges, um, people who in the context of a challenge stick with it, um, uh, the ability to influence and motivate others in a sophisticated way, in a way that appeals to, to what's, what drives people, um, organizational ability, problem solving ability. Um, so, so it's, but, but there's definitely, you know, the, it's, it's like anything else. Like you wanna hire the people who have the personal characteristics necessary to succeed. It's just, I think we're still gaining a greater and greater understanding of what those characteristics are. And, and what about training? I, 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 when I was growing up, I went going to a public high school. I think my physics teacher was our baseball coach. Uh, he had never seen. He didn't know anything about physics, and, and I don't know anything about physics today. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. How much difference does that make? Um, uh, well, you know. The, the well, let me ask you this: the teachers' colleges. What, what what's the difference between someone who goes and studies uh, mathematics in college or history in college versus going to a teacher's college? What What's the difference in the outcome? I mean, so, so the one reason I struggle with this question is that our own data does not, it doesn't show that if you majored in math, you're a better math teacher. It just it does doesn't not. show, no. That's interesting. So, you know, I'm sort of, but I do, the, you know, I think the broad studies would show that in certain subjects it does matter, and I think math and science are, are two of them. I mean, you, you, you need to know. I think, I think it's probably the fact that we're getting folks at this point of such, you know, strong content knowledge and, if they're teaching math and science, either they, if, if they didn't major in it, they took a lot of courses in it and probably, you know, have the content knowledge. You have to have the content knowledge. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's I, honestly, it's about the personal characteristics. And, and there is a lot, I mean, there's a huge skill base and knowledge base to teaching and Teach for America invests enormously in training and support. I mean, co contrary to kind of conventional wisdom, you know, I, we probably invest more than any other teacher provider in training and support. And so you, with, a, with a talent pool of 10 people for every slot, which is essentially the pool you're in, you can really recruit a lot of people who are gonna wind up in that top quartile, I would assume. Yep. You've really got an opportunity to, re, to, to enrich that You should that be pool. able to. It's very, very challenging, and selection <coughs> is very challenging. The cha yeah, so tell me about that, because I had a, I, 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 you and I both know the name of a, a major, major donor uh, to Teach for America whose child was turned down. Uh, uh, and, uh, there were many of them. So yeah, I know. It's sort of like a legacy. You're trying to get into Harvard, you know. If you get them turned down, you uh, there goes that gift. The um, uh, but but this guy came back. He's come back to the table. He, I know he wants to renew. So how do how do you make these choices? Because it's clear you don't make them based on political considerations. Um, yes, that is clear. This has been a big topic of discussion at the board level. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, in our work, the stakes are just so high. You know, not they're incredibly high for the kids, and they're incredibly high for the core members. And you know, this is not right for everyone. Um, and so, even if you're really committed and idealistic, you know, it, it just seriously might not be right for you. Um, and and we think we do everyone in the picture a disservice by having other considerations influencing the selection process. I mean, I have to qualify all of that by acknowledging the weaknesses of any selection system, and certainly. We are turning people away who, you know, we're certainly making wrong decisions, but we're making the best decisions we can, and we... You do personal interviews for everybody. Yeah, we, we do many stages of process, but personal interviews and problem-solving activities and group yeah. discussions and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, let's move down briefly, because I want to I want to be mindful of the time and also give people a chance to answer questions here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the magic of changing systems. As you said, that that's becoming now a bigger challenge, and you talked about New Orleans, uh, and Baltimore and Washington. What, what is what is what is the what's the, what's the key to changing systems? Um, one thing that's interesting about those three systems is that there have been big windows of opportunity on the governance side of things, um, so that you know so that the superintendents have the political cover to make tough decisions. Um, you know, very different in different places. In New Orleans, post-Hurricane Katrina, there was, you know, people really eliminated the school board and created a completely different world where it's sort of a system of charters. 
Um, in Washington, D.C., obviously the mayor took over the school system and, you know, appointed a school's chancellor. And, and in Baltimore, there's an appointed school board, which has, you know, provides a little more stability than, than elected school boards. Um, so that, that seems to be a piece of, of the puzzle. Um, it would not, serious change would not be happening in any of those communities if it weren't for, um, if it weren't for a pool of talent in those systems um, who have the foundational experience of having taught successfully in, mm. in low-income communities. And, you know, certainly, again, this goes beyond Teach for America alums, but in each of those cases, I, I just wonder, you know, if we extracted the Teach for America alums from the picture, it, it's hard to imagine that we would have, like, serious system-level change in, that's sure, transformational sure. in the way that yeah. we do. How many teachers do you have now in, in New Orleans? Um, we have 500 core members in the midst of their two years, so we're reaching one out of every three kids in New Orleans. Um, wow. And we have, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of alumni who are, you know, um, leading many, many, not just a few. I mean, I think back to, um, you know, four or five years ago before the hurricane in New Orleans. And I don't know if you all remember, you know, many of the, the folks in New Orleans were displaced and, and went to Houston and were in the Astrodome. Um, and our, our core members there were also displaced and, and they went to the Astrodome and recruited kids into a school. And the, the KIPP guys in, in Houston had a vacant school building, which they said, you all can use this for a year. And so they created an ad hoc school, um, which they called, uh, I believe, KIPP now, New Orleans West. <laughs> um, and um, I just remember going to this school and hearing our teachers say, I asked them, you know, where are your kids coming into the year? And, you know, I remember talking to one teacher who said, my eighth graders are at the second grade level. And I was shocked, and our New Orleans executive director was with me and she's like, you shouldn't be shocked. That's what we knew. And so, I mean, we're talking, things were so extreme in New Orleans and I just went there. I just went to New Orleans three weeks ago or so. I, I can't get over what I saw. Um, if, you're, if you're a family with kids growing up in New Orleans, you're in incredible shape. You can choose your school and you have lots of options options where I would personally love to send my kids. Can you imagine? I mean, literally think about that reality versus four years ago. I sat around in a round table of our alums in New Orleans, just some, some of them, you know, um, people who, many of whom were still, were teaching in the system. And I was so amazed to hear what I heard, you know, which was people say, I came to New Orleans because Teach for America assigned me there. I figured I'd leave in two years. I sort of fell in love with the city. This was happening long ago. I mean, you know, it's hard not to fall in love with New Orleans, but I never thought I would stay. Like, I just kept thinking I'm still here on a temporary basis. And what I heard from this group was people just saying, you know what, I think I'm going to stay in New Orleans. Like, we're buying houses. And I asked them what was different, and they said, you know what, we're a hot commodity in New Orleans. Um, so it's feasible to stay as a teacher, you know, because the schools have been given control over budgets. They can actually spend more on their teachers. Um, it's a war for talent. They're all competing to get, and, and they said, but let us be clear. It's not just about the Teach for America alums. Like the good people who were in the system kind of came out of nowhere. And, you know, I said, what happened to the bad people? And they were like, I guess they disappeared. <laughs> but it's just fascinating. Like it's, it's a new day in New Orleans public schools. And that, if anything, tells you what's possible. I mean, unbelievable. The, I, I honestly, I saw not only, not just one incredible school, but just spent my day walking from one to another. And still, I mean, there are huge problems in New Orleans. Still, um, absolutely, there are kids getting lost in the system. But it is unbelievable to see the incredible energy um, around and the incredible progress uh, that they're making. I mean, people were arguing over whether they were going to actually fully close the achievement gap in five years or ten years. That was the debate there. And knock on wood, you know, that it doesn't all fall apart, but incredibly encouraging to see mm. that. You have, are one of the few uh, social entrepreneurs and sort of the you become a poster child of this whole movement who's really uh, uh, managed to break through on, on 
are going to scale, and, you're, and yet you're not fully at scale, but you, 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 your budget is much, much, much bigger than most uh, new uh, nonprofits, uh, and yet you're facing enormous uh, financial challenges. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the financial challenges, about a building so that you can build the infrastructure so you can make all this work? I think, well, the financial challenges are born of our own, um, you know, how, our own desires to get much bigger and much better. Um, so, you know, we've grown our organization from a thousand teachers and a $10 million budget to where we are today. We've invested, not only have we grown, but we've invested a lot more in helping our teachers become better and helping to support our alums. So and today, the, budget, the budget for the record to, now is? Today we have, you know, today our budget is $200 million. Um, $200 million budget. And, and we have, as you heard, 7,000 core members, and next fall we'll have 8,000. But we see the possibility, you know, of we could double again in the next five years. We could. It would be incredibly challenging to pull it off. Um, but the opportunity is there from a recruitment perspective um, and from a placement perspective. And so the question is, you know, could we, can we, can we marshal the resources in this economic environment to grow at 20% in the next, each of the next two years, because that's what it would take. If we're gonna double again, we need to grow at 20% this coming year and the following year, and then we can, when the recruitment market might get a little tougher again, start growing again at 10% a year. That would double Teach for America. That would be extraordinary, right? If we could pull that off, we would be providing 30% of the new hires across the 60 highest need urban and rural communities in the country. Um, but you know that means that we have to find a path to more federal money in this economic environment, and that's a tougher challenge than it probably should be. I mean, we're not, you know, we're looking for 20% of our budget from the federal government. I mean, I don't know how many programs are leveraging for private sector dollars and local dollars for every federal dollar. Um, like this should be an easy argument, but it's tougher than it seems. It should be. She's being. Uh She's understating that <laughs> by, some, by some distance. But we have right. David Gergen's help, yeah, so you yeah, never you've, know. You've got, you've got a lot. You're, you're doing an extraordinary <laughs> job. But, but it's, uh, it's been a surprise to me how hard this is to grow, uh, given the success level and, uh, and how hard it is to get the support, the support from various uh, uh, institutions and uh, sectors. It's just it's very, very tough. And what no one should underestimate just, you know, you, you hear a lot from Wendy about how, how far it's come, but I don't, no one should underestimate just how hard it is for her. And, and that brings me to the final question. I, I, I think it, it comes as a great surprise to people when they hear that you have four children. <laughs> and how do you manage this? You, 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 how know. do you and your husband manage all this? <laughs> I mean, I you know. should tell, say a little bit about what your husband does. Um, well, I. My husband, I have a very supportive husband, although he is a very busy husband. Um, you know, he manages the KIPP network. Um, which she says quietly. She, he just of, manages the KIPP network, that's all. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know what, the kids are the best part of our lives. I mean, we both love our work, and I think I, at some level I'm just lucky, you know, in that I kind of found my passion before... I had my kids and I sort of, you know, I've spent years and years and years pursuing it and I just didn't view it as an option to like leave that. Not, not as an option I wanted to take, that is. And so I just spent all the energy instead of angsting about whether I could make it all work, I just went about trying to make, find a path. I mean, knock on wood, I mean, I of course am as angst ridden as the next person about whether we're doing justice to our kids and all of this, but you know, I don't know, it seems to be working. Um, How old is the eldest now? I have a fifth grader um, who, you know, is going through the middle school application process. I have I have three boys who are um, in kindergarten, second grade, and fifth grade in a public school near us, and a little two-year-old girl. Um, and, so you you worked on this pro and you worked on Teach for America without children for about ten years. Yeah. And then you've had about ten years when you've been balancing. Yeah. 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 You know what, they're my saving grace. If it wasn't for that, I'd just work 24 seven and this way you have to find, you have to draw some limits. And I've learned so much from, I don't know, somehow I think I'm probably more effective with kids and with the perspective that that, that, that brings. Yeah, I, I should I, I should amend, I'm gonna ask one more question. Because it, it, uh, it, Nick Kristoff had this extraordinary column today that some of you may have 
uh, read in the New York Times, uh, with it, which leads with the, with the fact that a generation ago, the Peace Corps was the, sort of the magnet and the, represented the ideal of a generation, and now it's Teach for America. Uh, they went on to argue that there ought to be more effort made internationally. And uh, Wendy, in fact, has been making that. There are a number of countries have come to her organization in other countries. You might say a few words about that effort. The, this column, actually, it was trying to, to persuade Nick Kristoff that, you know, his idea, what was his, his idea, which was in the column, was that we should have Teach for the World and we should recruit American students to go spend a year teaching in, in other countries. And I was trying to persuade him that a better idea um, would be to support the development of this model in other countries. You know, and, and the fact is, as, as David's alluding to, um, you know, together with our kind of colleagues in the UK who started the first adaptation of Teach for America called Teach First, we've created an organization called Teach for All, which is a network um, of organizations pursuing the same mission in, in all across the world. There are now 12 partner organizations of Teach for All. Um, you know, Teach for India as, as an example, which recruits Indian graduates, outstanding future leaders, and, and places them for two years in under-resourced contexts, and then with the theory being that they'll have an impact during the two years and go on and be you know, leaders for fundamental change. And um, you know, there's incredible momentum uh, in, in all sorts of regions of the world, in South America, in, in you know, it, all, all over, really. I mean, we have, there's probably you know, 25 programs in the pipeline in addition to the, the 12 who are already part of the network. Um, but I just think, I mean, of course, I'm a deep believer in this theory of change, and I just think um, you know, recruiting any given society's future leaders and, and having them go into the classroom and then work you know, to affect serious, long-term, sustained change in that system. I just think th that will be a very cost-effective strategy, so. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, uh, are there others then who want to uh, ask questions? I could go on here for a long time, but there's a microphone here, there's a microphone there. Uh, please go ahead, if you would identify yourself. Well, good. Uh, there is a, you can go use this other microphone, maybe a shorter line. The, uh, and uh, there's, we will, uh, we'll, we will, We'll start here, and, and please, short, please identify yourself, short, and with a question mark, one per customer, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I uh, grew up in Michigan, and I was quite impressed by the disparities between inner city Detroit and the suburbs. And it struck me that income tax, uh, property tax dollars would be collected at a district level, but not redistributed to schools that were just simply miles uh, between each other. Can you speak to some of the, the prospects of other types of structural changes in terms of funding that might help uh, the cause of promoting better schools? You know, I'm not an expert on, on, on the financial equity issues in the system, but I will say that, I mean, clearly we've seen significant reforms in many states uh, around um, financial equity. I mean, in, in you know, there, there are all sorts of uh, efforts in different districts, to, you know, implemented already that, that in fact allocate more dollars to kids who have the greatest disadvantages. And clearly, I mean, in, I've never seen a teacher or a school <coughs> serve kids who face extra disadvantages, you know, born of poverty, et cetera, th that where, where we're succeeding with kids without giving them a lot more. So this idea of attaining equity, you know, that, that's not gonna do it. You know, look, we need more time and more resources if we're going to end up with equal outcomes, um, but but I, we're seeing we're seeing systems that are pioneering that kind of uh, uh, finance reform. So I, th I think that's encouraging. We still also are seeing some states that are so far behind. You know, um, it's incredible to see what California spends on each kid versus what um, you know New York spends on every kid. California much less. Oh, so much less. It's like I don't know how they're going to make it. So interesting. Please. Hi, my name is Ellen Whitesides. I'm actually a former core member from New Orleans two years before the hurricane and one year after. And um, I wanted to ask you about um, one thing that I noticed while teaching in the schools was um, sort of a tension between the sustainability of core members within the system um, and um, to ask you sort of personally in your own life, I'm sure that you have to find a balance between 
having your family and also working in your job. And I was wondering sort of what is the long-term vision for Teach for America in terms of um, what should be the makeup of a public school? How many teachers should be from Teach for America or you know, recruited from elsewhere? Obviously, we want them all to be dedicated to the students, but um, you know, uh, how sustainable is the lifestyle of um, Jennifer Lopez, who works every Sunday, yeah. um, in terms of a long-term yeah. sustainability? You know, I mean, I say this all the time. I, I think, you know, it is so crucial for kids who are stuck in today's system to meet enough teachers who are willing to throw themselves in and go far above and beyond traditional expectations, you know, to make up for all the weaknesses of the system. Ultimately, that's not the answer, right? Like, I, I don't believe that we could possibly find enough people who have the, the talent and ability to do that to be true superheroes. I mean, Jennifer Lopez is a rare, rare, rare talent. Um, and she's willing to at least spend two years of her life just fully, fully d dedicated. But thus, the second part of Teach for America's mission, right, is to say that's not the end answer. Ultimately, to really solve this problem, we need serious system change. And, and I actually think, I mean, to, to look at some of the schools out there, I mean, certainly there are some of these high-performing schools, the 200, 300 or so very high-performing schools that exist today, which didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. Some of them are, you know, I think the teachers would be the first to say these are not sustainable environments. Um, but, but others are really doing a lot in an effort to make it sustainable. And, you know, you can structure a school that does make it sustainable for teachers. It's still going to rely on talented, driven people, but, but there's a lot you can do to, to you know, build into the structure of a school day um, you know, to, to make it possible. Please. Hi, my name is Rafi Rosenblatt. I'm a first year master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School, and I was also a 2006 core member in New York City. Um, arguably one of the greatest contributions that Teach for America has done is revitalizing the prestige of the teaching profession and pulling in all this great new talent. Um, but when we compare teachers in America to teachers in high performing school or high performing systems in other countries like Finland or Singapore, what we see is that um, in those countries they're able to attract the top 10% of their graduating college classes and it's a very competitive um, job that offers a lot of prestige. So my question is, what can we do in America um, from a policy standpoint to bring more prestige into the teaching profession and really galvanize it so as it's able to attract a really impressive and talented core of dedicated people? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one interesting fact is that um, actually, we, we did this little project, um, you know, where we, we worked with a group of our alums, who are many of whom still in teaching, others in kind of policy uh, positions that relate to teaching. And then we've done this broader survey to try to understand what would we need to do to keep talented, effective teachers longer in high need areas. Um, and you know, there were all sorts of interesting conclusions uh, from this. But one one just obvious fact is. We don't invest in teachers in their first years in the classroom in terms so when you look at where our teacher compensation dollars go, you know, if you look at from a policy perspective, go go figure out a way to find this data. It is absolutely phenomenal to see. We're spending our money on teachers beyond um, like 25 years in the system. Like I think something like half the money goes to that. And then we spend precious tiny, tiny fraction of our resources on teachers in their first six years. So it's not that much of a surprise, right, that you know, we're losing our teachers in vast numbers, far beyond Teach for America. Our numbers look pretty much like the rest of the system's numbers. Third year, fourth year, fifth year, you're losing all the teachers. Um, so what if we turn that upside down a bit? Like, what if we actually decided, let's invest a, a lot more, still a comparatively tiny fraction of where the compensation dollars go, but let's actually try to incentivize people. What if we actually had teacher evaluation systems that did enable us to differentiate between teachers, and then we started actually raising the salaries of teachers who are really effective early on in their career trajectory? Do you think we could keep teachers you know, I don't know if we could keep them, if they're the top 10%, et cetera, 25 years, 
but maybe we could keep them six or seven years. And then maybe we could actually give some of them who are truly exceptional serious, serious compensation boosts that would make it as you know, lucrative to be a teacher or a partner you know, as, as it is to at least you know, maybe not be an investment banker, but you know, I don't know, be a school principal. Um, so you start thinking, gosh, we, we really could, and I think there's lots of reason for optimism that I, I, you see lots of movement in terms of teacher policies and even collective <laughs> bargaining recently. I think you know, we need to think outside of the box, but it seems like there's a path um, to, to actually, just new paradigms potentially that could help us draw um, people in and actually keep, keep them there. Please. Yeah. Hi, Wendy Kopp. Uh, I'm Widar. I'm a second year student at the International Development Program. I'm from Indonesia, and I'm in the process of replicating the TFA model in, in Indonesia. And my question for you is, do you think the TFA model can still, is, is the right strategy in reducing um, in, uh, the disparity in education quality in the context when there is no shortage of teachers? Um. I think that there are practical challenges in making it work where there's no shortage of teachers, but having a surplus of teachers doesn't necessarily mean that the teachers are high quality. And so, yes, I think that they're, um, I mean, Teach for America is now at a point where, you know, it used to be that we would just be the provider of teachers if there were no other teacher candidates. That's how Teach for America started. Not only were there vacancies, but there just weren't any other teacher candidates, and so districts would say, okay, we'll hire a Teach for America person. Today, because we have a lot more evidence that actually our people are more effective than your alternative, you, you still need to have a vacancy to hire our teachers, but you can have all sorts of candidates and decide we're gonna hire the Teach for America people. Um, so over time, you know, you may be able, if you can find a way in, you may be able to build demand for your folks, even in, even in spite of the fact that there may be lots of other applicants for the positions. But, but Teach for All would love to in, engage with you and around all of, all of that and more. So you should look us up for sure, if you haven't already. Please. Hi, my name is Zach, and I'm a freshman at the college, and thank you very much for being here. Um, the Teach for America website right now is attempting to rally supporters to oppose congressional legislation that will open up federal funds to competitive grants as opposed to just giving money directly to Teach for America. Since the goal of Teach for America is to bridge the education gap, I'm just wondering why not allow for other reputable organizations with the same goals uh, to compete for these funds? Well, actually, we are, no, <laughs> you know, we're not asking people to, to oppose the competitive grant funds. We're just asking them to advocate ah. that Teach for America continues to get its um, direct appropriation. And in fact, um, you know, I've been running around on Capitol Hill for the last two days expressing the fact that we do embrace the principles upon which the competitive grants program exists. I just think that there are limitations um, when you get into, you know, how do we sustain and grow scaled programs that have already proven results? Um, and, and we just think that we may be able to create a category of programs um, still consistent with the same principles, um, but that actually is conducive. Uh, so, you know, when I think about uh, the Secretary's reforms, which we are, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm, if someone had predicted what our Secretary of Education would have done, you know, a year or two ago. I never could have predicted. It's incredible, the incredible progress in education reform that we've seen. But it, it also, I, I truly don't believe that we'll take advantage of the policy opportunities right now if we can't grow Teach for America. I, it, we just won't. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we grow Teach for America? And we can't do it through moving to a competitive grant system. Literally, there's not a chance that Congress could create the competitive grant systems and get money out the door in the context of 2011. So that would just mean Teach America goes a year without federal funding. Doesn't work that way. We will shrink 10% instead of growing 20%. Just like start shrinking Teach for America instead of growing it. So we've just got to find a different path. Hi, Randy Kopp. Uh, my name is Che Yong Pa. I'm from South Korea. Uh, before coming here, I didn't know what is Teach for, Korea, Teach for America. But um, thank you very much for influencing my life because I'm determined to set up Teach for Korea uh, after graduation. And I'm contacting with the Teach for All, Ryan and Cheryl. 
Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is, um, looking back uh, 15, 18 years of your Teach for America experience, uh, was it right decision to start straight from college or you need to build your educational uh, credentials or experience before you build a Teach for America? Or uh, another question is, um, uh, how did you manage resistance from um, teachers unions or local educational um, volunteer group or interest group? Because uh, in Korea, there's really strong um, teachers union. So I have two questions about this. Mm -hmm. um, well, to the second question, Teach for America works reasonably collaboratively with the teacher unions. Our people aren't displacing other teachers. They're assuming teaching positions and generally becoming part of the union. So, you know, we work with the local unions and really haven't had union issues over time. Um, I mean, of course, you'll see some slight exceptions to that, but usually just born of misunderstanding and then things get worked out. Um, to the first question, that's a tough question, you know, and I always say that, you know, my biggest asset at the front end of this was my inexperience. And, um, and I think some of the biggest assets of our teachers straight out of college is their inexperience and just the naivete of, you know, not knowing what is impossible. And honestly, I don't know. If I had waited five years, would I have started Teach for America? I don't know, because then I would have known more about how the world works, and it was crazy. I look at it myself, like how Teach for America went from idea to 500 teachers in a year. I don't know. It took a bit of naivete, you know? And at the same time, our experience is absolutely brilliant evidence of the advantages of experience, you know? I mean, we learned many things the hardest way possible. Um, so I think that there are different paths to start different, different things, and, and I think, you know, it would have benefited from experience, but at some level I'm glad I didn't wait because I might not have actually done it. We have time for two more questions, yes. Hello, I'm Ronna Kiley. Um, I live in Cambridge and I was involved with Teach First. As Wendy knows, I was a founder of Teach First when we lived in England. Um, and I'm just back from India um, where they're in their first year in the classroom of Teach, te this was a, a product of Teach for All, Teach for India is very much an inspiration. I'm not going to go on and make a speech about it, but one of the things that I worry about, um, and it's very related to your problem in terms of funding, is how do we help these countries to be sustainable? Um, and how can they make this? In other words, the government in India is not putting any money into Teach for India. If they want to grow this model, and they have wonderful young teachers who are as dedicated as any of the American teachers are, working for very little money, but um, how do we help governments mm -hmm. grow the idea of supporting this as a way of raising prestige, of raising um, the quality of teaching throughout their systems? And mm -hmm. that's something that I hope we can work on yeah. um, because um, we want to sustain these wonderful young people who are giving back so much. Yeah. You know, Teach for All has, has felt pretty strongly <coughs> that you know, it's critical that these organizations be independent, not that you're saying anything else other than that, but from the government. So, you know, we are partnering with social entrepreneurs who are working in collaboration with the private sector and the public sector to do what they do. And, and these different social entrepreneurs have different theories about how to get to the point where they are sustainable, where they have the level of government support that you just inevitably need if you're going to attain real scale. And what I've been interested in in India is that, you know, whether you're talking to the McKinsey consultants or the social entrepreneurs or the significant private sector donors, there seems to be this belief that the path to government support is to first you know, demonstrate success and then convince the government to invest. So they are on that path. I mean, they believe that that's how they're gonna get there. Um, you know, it's not the decision Teach for America made. Um, I think Teach for America would have thought if we don't start with the government paying the salaries, we're never going to get there. Um, but that, I don't think that means it's not the right answer for the Indian program. So, I think the private sector uh, 
experience of getting money from the private sector is very important, that it not be totally government supported, and I didn't really, but the sustainability factor. Um, right, it's just that they agree, so they're, they're trying to get government support. They just believe that first doing the pilot program and then and then bringing the government around is, is the way to go. So we'll see, we'll see if it works. But that's Teach for All, you know, absolutely, we, we would agree. Thank we you. have, I'm afraid, time for just one last question. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Katia Melkote, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School and a 2005 New York City Corps member. You, you mentioned TFA's continued aggressive growth plans and plans to double the core in the near future. I'm wondering if you feel that there's a need to strike a balance between really supporting the current core members and ensuring their impact in the classroom versus continually growing the core. Um, what's interesting, I mean, as, as you may know, you know, when we set out to grow our impact, we, we set out to grow in scale, but also to increase the impact of the teachers during their two years and to do more to support our alums. And, um, you know, I don't want to put, I mean, I am our worst critic. If you saw me behind the scenes in the office, I mean, you know, there's such a higher level we can be operating at. But honestly, we're investing so much more today than we simply were able to invest when we were at a smaller scale in supporting and training and developing our core members well. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. You know, we have a completely different level of, of staff. I could never have envisioned the people who I'm now surrounded with by at Teach for America. You know, people who gave up massively lucrative private sector careers. Obviously, they're not making that much money at Teach for America, but they're making enough that they could make that transition who have just a completely different experience base. Um, so just a different level of talent. Um, a completely different level of financial resources. At our 10th year, we had a three-person team responsible for designing the training curriculum and executing it. And they would hire temporary staff during the summer to manage all the training. Today, we have 40 people working on designing the training curriculum, and we've got however many people working on executing it. You know, it's just, we could never have afforded that level of basically R&D. Um, and it's just because economies of scale, you know, um, you know, we can justify that expense over many, many more core members. Um, so, you know, and plus you're forced to systematize. I mean, we should have forced ourselves to get a little more systematized when we were at a smaller scale, but when you're at a larger scale, it does force a different level, I think, of thinking. So, and if you look at all the numbers, you know, whether it's retention of core members um, or satisfaction or effectiveness, really, Things, everything has moved in the right direction even as, as we've grown. Again, lots more to be done, but, and, and when we look at the next five years, we're feeling certainly as much urgency to train and develop our core members well and to invest in our alums as, as we're feeling to grow, so. Thank you. I should tell you that uh, Wendy has a plane to catch and probably will be moving out of here fairly rapidly. Uh, upon our conclusion, but I do, on behalf of the Institute of Politics, Bill Purcell, uh, and our center, and, and indeed the entire Harvard community, uh, want to thank you. I, I, you may be aware of a tradition in Japan of um, uh, naming some individuals, living individuals, uh, national treasures, uh, national treasures. And I think it can well be said that if we had such a tradition in the United States, you would be right on our list at the top of a national treasure. Thank you. That's, thank you, David. <clears throat> <clears throat>